this lecture will explain what are some of the problems that can be introduced uh, when we have unrepresentative samples and what are some of the sources of a lack of representation in our samples. So let's talk about an example here. Let's think about um, a study that you might want to do that looks at support for Obamacare. And your hypothesis is that those voters that have been employed, um, unemployed for six months or more, some time over the past 25 years, are more likely to support Obamacare. And your reasoning is that if you've had an experience of unemployment, you're pretty wary of depending only on um, your employer's insurance, and you might be more interested in having some sort of universal system, so you'd be more likely to support Obamacare. Right, so to do this, um, you conduct a survey among a sample of American voters to assess overall support for Obamacare. And um, so what we're going to do here is think about ways in which this study could go awry. What are some of the ways that this survey that you've done on the sample could face problems if that sample was not representative? So what do you need to keep in mind? So first, you might have a sample that's unrepresentative of a larger population due to chance, just due to some sort of fluke. Um, so this is called sampling error, when your sample is unrepresentative of the population due to chance. Um, so the larger your sample is, the lower the sample error is. And the bare minimum that you need is 25. And the idea is that if you're collecting a sample of, say, only 10 people, um, you know, just by chance you might have a sample that isn't representative of the population. The law of large numbers tells us that as our sample gets larger, it's going to be more likely to be representative of the population. So a key point is to remind everyone that the sample size that you need for inference doesn't actually depend on the population size. And this is the beauty of the law of large numbers. Um, it's key to have a fairly large sample, but even if you have a population of 300 million people, uh, it doesn't mean you need a sample, you know, 100,000 in order to get good inferences. You can sample just 1,000 and make fairly um, accurate inferences out of that sample. Okay, so again, sampling error is when due to chance, um, due to having usually a low sample, size, um, you have a sample that's not representative of the population. So going back to our example of Obamacare um, and thinking about support for Obamacare, suppose you did a sample where 60% of people in your sample are Democrats. Now this is a lot larger than the general population. And if you only sampled 15 people, well, there's a good possibility that you're going to have 60% that are Democrats just by chance. Um, it could just happen sometimes. It doesn't mean that you had any kind of bias, that you were intentionally over-selecting Democrats, um, but it just happened. And this is something that, that occurs when you have a sample size that's too low, particularly one that's under 25. Even if your sample is bigger, there's always a possibility that your sample doesn't match up just due to, to chance that you might select um, abnormal groups of people. So, in contrast to the previous slide where I talked about um, when you have a lack of representat representativeness due to, to chance, you could have also unrepresentativeness that's due to some sort of systematic error, some kind of bias. And this is called selection bias. This is where your sample is unrepresentative of a larger population due to some sort of systematic error in who is included in that sample from the population. So I'm going to talk about two different forms of, of selection bias. First, it's called sample bias. Um, just keep in mind here the word bias is in this, and that means that there's some sort of um, systematic error going on. It's not um, a larger flaw where you just do the chance. It's bias in a direction. So sample bias is where you have a flaw in the sampling procedure mean that you're excluding certain types of people from the, the sample overall, okay? There's a couple forms this could take. Uh, first, you could have a sample frame that doesn't actually reflect the population. So imagine that you're um, trying to sample these American voters for this Obamacare study, and you use landlines as your proxy for um, American voters, so that's your sampling frame. Well, there's a problem with using landlines um, as a sampling frame is that certain kinds of voters are a lot less likely 
to have a landline, namely young people. Young people are not likely to have landlines. They're much more likely to only rely on cell phones. And as you get older, you're more likely to have a landline. So you might be uh, systematically excluding younger people from your sample because of how you set up your sampling frame. And this is particularly problematic if you think that younger people may be more likely to support Obamacare. Um, so you're systematically leaving out people who would support Obamacare from your sample. Another way that you can have sample bias is that there's bias in selection from the sampling frame. So say you have this um, sampling frame of all these landlines and you only call the first 500 names on the list. Maybe you're only calling people whose names begin with A. So you can imagine that maybe certain ethnicities are less likely to have names that begin with A. Um, maybe say Latinos um, are less likely to have names that begin with A, they have more names that begin with M or R. Um, so they are not going to be included in that sample and you're going to be over um, sampling certain groups of people. Again, this is not going to represent the larger population and you'd be introducing some sort of bias against some kind of poor people. And it's especially problematic if maybe Latinos are more likely to support or perhaps oppose Obamacare than others from the general population. So the other form of selection bias that we can see is called non-response bias. This is where you're missing data for certain types of respondents, that um, they were included in the sampling frame, but they are just not included in the sample for, for whatever reason, um, so that there is some sort of um, bias that's going on that way. And you can think of this as maybe bias that happens from, on behalf of the respondents themselves. Okay, so let's think about that telephone landline example. Um, so some people might be more likely to let the phone just go to voicemail than other people. Um, or some people might be more likely to answer the phone when you call between 6 and 8 p.m. So you, I could say perhaps that um, I think that uh, wealthier and more conservative people are more likely to answer the phone between 6 and 8 p.m. They're more likely to work regular nine to five jobs. They're not you know, working the graveyard shift. Um, and so as a result, they're going to be over included in our sample because they decided to respond when I called them. Um, and again, people who are conservative are going to be less likely to oppose Obama or to support Obamacare. And as a result, we're getting a biased sample that we are building here. So these have been several ways that you can have unrepresentative samples. And I've talked throughout about how this can introduce problems in making larger inferences about our population.